Frodo! Oh. Silence. No! Hey there, guys. This is Richard, your host, with another marvelous video. This time, Mouth of Sauron, exploring one of the deadliest servants of the Dark Lord. The lieutenant residing in the Tower of Barad-dûr, the Mouth of Sauron, is the herald and envoy of the Dark Lord, Sauron, and as he prefers to be known, Sauron the Great. This enigmatic person appears just once in Tolkien's Legendarium during a pivotal battle before Sauron's demise. We don't ever hear from him again neither during the conflict nor afterwards when the One Ring is shattered and his lord is defeated. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. A brief background of the mouth of Sauron. If Aragorn and company had created a week's worth of empty, yet necessary drama in the fifth segment of the Lord of the Rings book series, they are confronted with a wildly overproduced bombast upon their arrival at the Black Gate. It opens with a parody of Aragorn's own trumpets and heralds. Then came a long rolling of gigantic drums linking thunder in the mountains, and then a braying of horns that shook the very stones of the foundation. Then there's the Mouth of Sauron, which is ready to tear any landscape placed in front of him. Of course, the Mouth of Sauron is wildly superfluous. Sauron has no reason to send an emissary, and he has no reason to come to any type of agreement. In his view, he has already won. All that remains is for him to insult and degrade first. The whole affair is a near-absurd display of pomp, with a nameless guy prancing around on a monster horse, giving meaningless words. But in contrast to Aragorn's theatre of calm, dignity and dubious usefulness, the mouth of Sauron's bombast is supported with unmistakable force. He's a blend of pettiness and strength, which makes him one of the more fascinating secondary characters. The reader is told as he rides out of the gates that his name is remembered in no story, for he had himself forgotten it. He then uses an informal style of grammatical address to refer to them as dumb and little. He threatens Gandalf for ultimately spinning webs too deep and then shrieks in terror when Aragorn stares at him too closely, and Gandalf releases a flash of light, for he is a herald and an envoy, and he may not be assailed. He goes on and on about how dwarf, coat, elf, cloak, sword of the downfallen west and spy from the tiny ratland of the Shire are all signs of a worldwide conspiracy. He literally winks at them boldly while reading the stipulations, gloating at the fact that he'll be able to reign over them from Isengard. The mouth of Sauron is campy, and in another setting he may have undermined Mordor's dread and authority. Of course, he does not. It makes no difference how he behaves. He can be whatever he wants, because it doesn't matter. In the end, he's the one with a dagger, a cloak, as well as a mithril shirt, and he's the one with the power. During the War of the Ring, the Mouth of Sauron was one of the Dark Lord Sauron's most dedicated minions, acting as his herald as well as his messenger, as well as the lieutenant of the Tower of Barad-dûr. Even he had forgotten what his real name was, and so had everyone else. The Mouth of Sauron was originally a man whose origins are extremely unclear. He actually was one of the Black Numenorians, a race of men that settled in Middle-earth during Sauron's reign and adored him. The Black Numenorians, formerly known by the name the King's Men, were actually a fallen group of Numenorians who had descended from those who were devoted to the Numenorian Scepter, but opposed the Valar and any and all connections with the Elves. After Sauron was transported as a captor in Numenor in his fair form, the Numenorians listened to his speeches and were soon corrupted by him. They worshipped the darkness and its masters, Melkor and eventually even Sauron, and persecuted the remaining men living in Middle-earth. They had been the enemy slaves and the men of Gondor's sworn opponents ever since. When the mouth of Sauron came to rise once again, he joined the assistance of the Dark Tower. He acquired the power of sorcery, ascended to the rank of Lieutenant of Barad-dûr, and led Gorgoroth's orc forces. He was one of the very few Mordor slaves who could converse directly with Sauron. Mouth of Sauron in War of the Rings even before the Battle of the Black Gate, the Mouth of Sauron appears momentarily before the hosts of the West. He rejected Aragorn's claim to be the king and asked to know who had the power to deal with him. However, Aragorn's stare terrified him, and he shouted out that he was an envoy and should not be assaulted. Gandalf promised him that he would not be, thus the Mouth appointed Gandalf as the representative. He gave them Sam's sword, a grey cloak that had an elven brooch and Frodo's mithril vest, and told them that the destiny of the spy would now be determined by their deeds and that if they actually did not cooperate, the spy would then be tormented for many years. 
The mouth then stated that now the Hobbit would be given the freedom to leave as long as all the captains came to an agreement to Sauron's terms, that now the rabble of Gondor and of its deluded allies would withdraw beyond the Anduin River or the Great River of Wilderland, swearing oaths to never again to assail Sauron the Great in arms, open or hidden, and that all lands to the east of the Anduin River would now belong to Sauron in perpetuity, and that all of the lands west were up to Sauron if would allow them to handle their own affairs as long as they helped rebuild Isengard, which would subsequently be controlled by a ruler more trustworthy than Saruman, who would presumably be the mouth himself. Gandalf answered that that was too much for a single servant's ransom, and he doubted Sauron would follow his word, dubbing him the base master of treachery. Gandalf requested that the prisoner be released, but the mouth merely said, These are the terms and conditions. You may either take them or leave them. Gandalf said, These we will take, and took the cloak, sword, as well as the mithril coat, completely rejecting Sauron's demands and ordering the mouth to take his leave, as they had not come to negotiate with Sauron, or even one of the Dark Lord's mere servants. Enraged and terrified at the same time, the mouth ran back to the Black Gate and unleashed Mordor soldiers against the formidable army of the West. I have a token I was bidden to show thee. His role in the Lord of the Rings movie trilogy. Scenes involving the mouth of Sauron were filmed, but not actually used in the original theater release of Peter Jackson's film named The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. In the expanded edition, these sequences were later restored and were released as planned originally. The mouth of Sauron is beheaded by Aragorn in the movies, although he flees to the Black Gate in the novels. He's portrayed by Bruce Spence as a towering, grotesque man wearing black-colored priest-like robes and a headpiece emblazoned with the statement, Lamen Gothor which, in the Sindarin language, has the meaning Voice of the Dreaded Abomination, inscribed in Kirth runes. This helmet obscures the majority of his face, revealing just his severely scarred and sickly lips. His lips were digitally enlarged to give him a more scary and distinctive appearance. The cracked, black lips and rotten teeth of Sauron's mouth were added as a clue that Sauron's mere words are so wicked that simply saying them over and over again causes the speaker's mouth to bleed and decay. This alteration was accomplished digitally after the film had been shot, after the director of the movies, Peter Jackson, rejected the concept of flipping the mouth to the side to look vertical on his face, the costume designers came up with the idea of making it twice as big as it was originally. According to designer Warren Mayhew, the initial concept for the mouth of Sauron's outfit had the helmet attached directly inside his mouth, pushing it and keeping it open permanently. This idea was rejected since it made it hard for the actor to talk. Peter Jackson, on the other hand, enjoyed the notion of the robe flowing up inside the helmet, thus it was kept in the finished version. The mouth of Sauron makes an appearance in the 64th scene of The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, in the movie's extended edition. This particular scene was not included in the theatrical release of The Lord of the Rings movie's original version named The Return of the King. Aragorn, Legolas, Gandalf, Gimli, Pippin, and Merry ride up to the very foot of the Black Gate and summon the cruel and wicked Lord of the Black Land and ask him to come forth. The Black Gate then opens to send a message, and the evil, grotesque, and deformed messenger is the infamous character named the Mouth of Sauron. Gandalf's warning to the Dark Lord Sauron is to depart his realms forever and never return. The Mouth then goes on to offend Gandalf and the rest of the party by bringing Frodo's mithril vest to them. Merry and Pippin are very evidently upset, and the Mouth then recognizes that the vest-wearing halfling was actually a close friend of the group. He continues by claiming that Frodo suffered tremendously at the hands of Sauron. Gandalf's eyes then well up with tears, while Legolas, Gimli, Pippin, and Merry seem distressed. Aragorn pulls his horse near to the mouth, who then begins to antagonize and goad Aragorn. Aragorn proceeds to behead him, stating he does not trust the information he's just heard about Frodo. The mouth intimated to the group and said he would torture Frodo if the West did not accept Sauron's terms of acquiesce. Gandalf removed the goods from the mouth of Sauron and sent him away. Sauron's soldiers approached and encircled the army of the West. Sauron's army greatly outnumbered the army of the West by at least ten to one. The army of the West separated itself into two rings on the rubble hills opposite the gate. Gandalf, Aragorn, and all of the sons of Elrond were on the left, with Eomer, the knights from Dol Amroth and Imrahil, on the right. Hordes of trolls, orcs, and men, Easterlings, as well as the Haradrim, stood in their way. For the first time, the Ologhai, who were enhanced versions of trolls, made their appearance. During the fight, the hobbit Pippin took, going forward as a guard of the citadel of Minas Tirith, slaughtered a troll. The remaining Nazgul hung over the army of the West, 
spreading terror and uncertainty. The Ringwraiths were assaulted by the enormous eagles from the great misty mountains headed by Gwahir, who was the Wind Lord. When everything appeared to have been lost, Frodo donned the One Ring, indicating to Sauron that Frodo was actually inside Mount Doom and the One Ring was in grave danger. He instantly called the wicked Nazgul from the combat to intercept Frodo and the army of Mordor was thrown into confusion without Sauron's attention. Gollum snatched the ring from Frodo's finger. As Gollum rejoiced, he threw the ring inside the Crack of Doom, completely destroying Sauron's power. The Nazgûl were then killed. The foundations of Barad-dûr, the Black Gate, as well as the Towers of the Teeth, all fell as a result of the ring's power. Sauron died. His massive shadow emerged in the sky and stretched out in rage, but was blown away and his spirit was rendered bodiless and powerless for all times. With Sauron's death, the orcs and the rest of the creatures of Sauron were eventually left with no direction and were quickly destroyed by the army of the West. Some committed suicide while others escaped. The Haradrim and noble Easterlings fought valiantly, but many surrendered in order to be returned home with dignity by Aragorn when he created the reborn and unified kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor. With the possible exception of the decapitation at the conclusion of the scene and the omission of Imrahil, Elrohir and Eladan, the encounter between the Mouth of Sauron and the Captains of the West in this scene is quite similar to that in the chapter in the Lord of the Rings book named The Black Gate opens. In the novels, like in this moment, Gandalf leads the charge against the Mouth of Sauron. However, instead of just portraying the mithril overcoat, the mouth also depicts Captain Sam's short sword and a grey robe with an elven brooch. Rather than destroying the mouth at the end of the discussions, Gandalf takes all three tokens from his hand and instructs him to depart. In terror of the captains, he escapes back to the land of Kirith Gorgor. And who is this? Is he the some interesting theories around the mouth of Sauron. We'll discuss a few of the most widely popular speculations that have circulated on the web over the years, ideas that can be found on almost any Tolkien-related website. We shall then proceed to support our opinions with the text themselves for each idea, whether we believe in them or not. These theories are as follows. The first is that the messenger at Dane's Gate is the mouth of Sauron, and the second is that the mouth of Sauron possesses a great ring of power. There's nothing wrong with seeing the messenger as the mouth of Sauron. We don't really think this was the case, but if someone produced proof that we had overlooked, we'd absolutely reconsider. The relationship between the messenger and the dwarves is the first argument we found in support of him being the mouth of Sauron. They can tolerate his presence despite their discomfort. He can't be a ring wraith, can he? Isn't it true that simply being in their presence makes you feel horribly cold, afraid, and as if you're about to die? Not exactly. This might be due to Peter Jackson's adaptations which show these corrupted and fading men as unnatural, scarcely able to talk without sounding sinister and simply ghastly. This is not necessarily how they seem in the novel. Yes, they're creepy and unfinished tales tells us that the horror that went with them was so strong, even though they were unseen and unclad, that their aura could be felt and it was a terror to all living creatures they passed close to. But while dealing with humans, they'll most likely do their utmost to appear regular, failing to come off as anything other than malevolent. Nonetheless, there are times when they do interact with ordinary people. Early readers of The Lord of the Rings may mistake the messenger for one of the ring wraiths. This was due to the fact that when the Council of Elrond convened, the principal enemies we had been facing so far, those individuals representing the faraway Dark Lord, were the ring wraiths. The fact that Gloin is talking of a messenger from such a faraway land just makes the Black Riders seem like an even bigger danger than we imagined. In the chapter, in which everything becomes more significant and nobler in scale, the Hobbit's small adventure in trying to reach Rivendell is but one tale in the adventure of all those who were sooner or later drawn to Elrond's home. We don't find out who the mouth of Sauron is until much later, and the messenger's character drew us to the ring wraiths with their incapacity to disguise evil beneath false promises. This is the way a ring wraith might appear to a newcomer. We are informed that the messenger may sweeten his speech if he wished to before being explained his seeming relationship with Sauron. We can only envision an uncomfortable exchange when this evil figure bluntly attempts to communicate these words of companionship to the dwarves, causing everyone to feel uneasy and intimidated in the process. This is a messenger, not an emissary, and there is a distinct difference, particularly in how this message is delivered to the dwarves dwarves aggressively. Combine this with the frightening hiss response after questioning if the dwarves would decline Sauron's gracious offer. In other conflicts, the ring wraiths hiss, though not always. The envoy is unable to completely disguise his will and hatred from the dwarves. Nonetheless, it's easy to believe that this apparition, if not a ring wraith, is the mouth of Sauron. The explanation for this appears to be accepted by many. The only servant acknowledged to have mentioned his master's identity in The Lord of the Rings is the Mouth of Sauron, and of course this messenger, though through the words of Gloin. 
In the Two Towers, Aragorn informs us that when the captains of the West approach the Black Gate and the return of the King, they're met by someone who speaks the name of Sauron. We can only envision this envoy being allowed the special authority to use his name while dealing with Sauron's opponents, maybe even emissaries from other kingdoms who would only recognize Sauron by that identity. This person, as a representative of Sauron's own special form of diplomacy, could thus openly communicate with the free folk without fear of his presence. This information derived from Aragorn's statement is indeed intriguing. There are other explanations, and if one high-ranking servant of Sauron may use the name, why can't others? Why must this figure be the same as the one who uses it later on in the story? Perhaps Aragorn means that orcs and other disposable slaves of Sauron were not entitled to use it, which appears to be the case, given that orcs refer to Sauron by various titles, such as the Great Eye or even Lugburs, alluding to his tower. Perhaps no one uttered the name, and it was instead translated for us just like Melkor is the only one who calls himself Morgoth after being given the name Melkor. Or perhaps only specific persons Aragorn had never interacted with or observed were allowed to use it. We may infer he never encountered Sauron's mouth. How could Aragorn know all about Sauron and Mordor's rules? Another reason we don't believe this theory of the mouth of Sauron is because he acts differently than the messenger at the gateway. He carries out his responsibilities as an ambassador and emissary. He appears to be very well spoken and significantly better at concealing his real motives from everybody except for people who possessed acute insight and sense. When he offers Sauron's demands to Gandalf, his eyes betray him. He's often able to deceive when dealing with those who are not as sensitive as Aragorn and Gandalf. He doesn't hiss and makes no attempt to sugarcoat his comments. He talks with the power of his position, believing himself to be more than competent at speaking to Gandalf and Aragorn, Sauron's future war prisoners. He seems to be a politician. He is the mouth of Sauron because he talks for him the king of treachery, deception, and cunning. His statements don't sound anything like the ones we heard at Dane's Gate, do they? What about the schedule? Because of the Dunedain's caution and Saruman's deceit, regular spies and agents of Sauron were unable to deliver him news. Aragorn discovered Gollum, who had been liberated from Mordor in the Dead Marshes at the start of February 3017. The Ringwraiths would already have been entrusted with gathering data. We hear a lot about them the following September and early October when they failed to discover the Shire. They were taken to Isengard, where they met Germa Wormtong, who informed them of the Shire's location. They arrived at San Ford after conquering the Rangers. A Ringwraith chatted with Farmer Maggot, two came to the Prancing Pony as the Hobbits were traveling in the Old Forest, and Gandalf confronted Ringwraiths on Weathertop. What were they up to before this? Based on the details revealed by Gollum during his torture in Mordor, they were searching for information about the Shire and Baggins. Gloin. When did he say the messenger showed up? It was about a year ago. It seemed plausible to infer the messenger was among the Ringwraiths, the individual Sauron had dispatched to expressly find information. But we can't exclude the possibility that this message was neither a Ringwraith nor the mouth of Sauron. Sauron has a large number of servants, the most of whom go undetected and nameless throughout the tale. But before we go on to the next possibility, the final evidence that points to a Ringwraith is owing to their association with Sauron himself. Despite his seeming devotion to Sauron's rule, the mouth of Sauron had drive and ambition, which led him to become such an influential servant of the Dark Lord in the very first place. He's characterized as a human. The Ringwraiths lack the capacity to go against Sauron's will. They'd vanished completely, becoming shadows beneath his massive shadow, slaves to the point that they couldn't fall farther under his spell. The messenger at the gate has access to the Dark Lord's most sensitive and crucial information. He is aware of the least of rings and its actual significance to Sauron. Few people would be entrusted with such sensitive knowledge. Ringwraiths may be trusted to not only look for the One Ring, but to return it to Sauron in Mordor as quickly as the wind. There was no doubt they had no awareness of their own strength. They are unable to deceive him. If they have news, they will inform Sauron, and if they have the ring, Sauron will regain it. According to Tolkien, only the Ringwraiths could obey Sauron in this fashion. This led us to conclude that the messenger at the gateway was most likely a Ringwraith. Some fans speculate that the mouth of Sauron possessed one of the legendary Great Rings of Power, and this is a concept that is both complicated and interesting to those who believe it. The appearance of the cruel mouth of Sauron contains two main points of interest relating to his probable age, which seem to appear to be the major reason many assume this. He would then be too old to be living and could only be alive if he donned a ring of power that permitted him to stay alive for many centuries. It appears that he is so ancient that he has actually forgotten his original name, although this may not actually even be the case. We can explain this by claiming that, as a black Numenorian, he is an individual who became captivated with knowledge of evil, rising in Sauron's favor 
and eventually becoming the infamous Mouth of Sauron. His previous identity is no longer vital or required when it came to his own existence. His title replaces his name as he continues to serve Sauron. He is known as the Mouth of Sauron when dealing with both allies and adversaries. Years of servitude to the wicked Dark Lord have perverted him to the degree that he lives and thrives only for the sake of serving his lord. Tolkien's comments in the book simply reflect the terrible and twisted nature of this new character. Those who believe in this view hold the belief that even when Sauron came back from Numenor during the Second Age when Numenor was destroyed, he rebuilt his own dominion once again. He returned to Middle-earth and Mordor as a shadow and a dark, desolate wind across the sea. In Barad-dûr, he picked up his great ring once more. It would also render the mouth of Sauron extremely ancient, thousands of years old, much beyond the normal lifespan of a mere mortal. This doesn't make sense for a variety of reasons. Firstly, the background of all the magical great rings of power is well documented, and this man acquiring one at this time period does not fit in any manner. We all know that the Nazgul initially made their appearance in the Second Age in the year 2250 or 2251, depending on what source we're referring to. During the year 1697, within the same age, Sauron claimed that all the powerful rings that would ultimately go to men during his fight against the elves. We don't know for certain how long it will take every one of the men to face their downfall and fade away. In the beginning, each of them would fall as per their natural power and the good or ill of their wills. Sauron had millennia to corrupt them but they eventually succumbed and became wraiths. This signifies that there is no way for this living person to bear one of the nine mysterious rings of power in the time frame. He would have been among the nine if he'd been awarded one of the rings during the Second Age. He couldn't have gotten a single one of these rings later on. The text never indicates that Sauron ever redistributed these rings, which belonged to the ring wraiths in essence, who were completely bound to their rings, which Sauron now owned. This is simply not feasible. Perhaps, like Schmeagol, the wicked mouth of Sauron possessed one of the rings but seldom used it, just maintaining his existence and, in a manner, postponing the fading process. But that's stretching the theory, and we could possibly wonder why Sauron would do this. This argument just does not work, and there is no proof for it in the text. However, there are many other great rings, like the ones handed to the dwarves. But Sauron treasured the ones that remained, despite the fact that four of the seven were destroyed. Of course, the envoy at the gate may have been lying when he gives these three to the dwarves. In the year 2845, in the Third Age, Sauron took the last one of the seven rings off King Thrain in Dol Guldur. Again, the language in the text makes it obvious that Sauron has these. But what is the second reason for seeing the evil mouth of Sauron as old doesn't work? The land of Barad-dûr was still not overthrown or destroyed when Sauron was brought to Numenor. He took leave from his watchtower during the year of 3262 in the Second Age, was carried over the sea, and reappeared in the year 3319. Eventually, he was defeated by the powerful Last Alliance during the year 3441. Because it had been erected with the might of the One Ring, its foundations remained. When he came back in the Third Age, he spent most of his time in the depths of the Mirkwood, which was in Dol Guldur, while the great land of Mordor was prepared for his inevitable return by the Ring Wraiths. He fled Dol Guldur during the year 2941 during the Third Age, and then was reported to go back to Mordor a year later. In the year 2951, work on his headquarters in the Dark Tower of Barad-dûr resumed. This was the very first time it was reconstructed. Constructed. This actually was the second building, and rather than the 600 years it required to be constructed the first time, it just took a few decades this time. This might be due to the roots that remained tied to the presence of the great and practically undefeatable One Ring. This was the first time the tower arose once again. The year is 3019, the time when the mouth of Sauron advances out of the Black Gate. Doesn't it make more sense to assume that this black Numenorian, portrayed as a living and breathing man, had been in Sauron's service for decades? Not years, and certainly not millennia millennia, just decades. Barad-dûr first rose anew during the previous century, not the final age. He was the first to serve during the early days after the tower was reconstructed. The mysterious mouth of Sauron may certainly be a man of Aragorn's age or a bit older, which accords with his ancestry and probably his affiliation with black magic under Sauron's sway. This explanation works, yet envisioning him as one of the ring bearers has no validity, creating further concerns. An effort to make what is already an interesting and enigmatic figure even more fascinating by confounding matters. He appears to have joined Mordor's service at or shortly after the tower's construction in the Third Age. My master, Sauron the Great, bids thee welcome.
How powerful was the Mouth of Sauron? There are reasons to believe that the mysterious Mouth of Sauron was actually a tremendous figure of authority. He was a black Numenorian, not of a noble ancestry like Aragorn, but a lofty man in comparison to the rest of the men who lived in Middle-earth, physiologically superior and long-lived. He was a magician, trained in many powerful forms of magic. We have no instances or examples of his skills, although he may have worked with the evil Nazgul in the Dark and Black Arts. Because of this, as well as his evilness and intellect, he was much eviler than any orc and understood a lot about Sauron's thinking. He was granted a high standing in Mordor, greater than any other follower of Sauron save the Nazgul, and maybe only the Witch King. He was actually the lieutenant, next in command of Barad-dûr, where the Nazgul did not appear to inhabit. There is some indication that there were still a large number of black Numenorians led by the Ringwraiths in Mordor, particularly in Minas Morgul, and that they inhabited the area. The fallen soldiers that captured Minas Ithil under the leadership of Ringwraiths were formerly men of Numenor, if not Easterlings as well as Haradrim, as the black Numenorians. The Mouth of Sauron was likely the most notable of them in Mordor. There have been talks regarding whether he possessed a ring of power to explain his longevity, and some believe he was 3,000 years old. However, those assumptions are false. We believe he could have fought Aragorn or any part of the Fellowship, save Gandalf, because he was still a high man and wizard as well as a herald and ambassador, but also a commander who, like Gothmog residing in Minas Morgul and also Sauron himself in Angband, was adept in personal battle and warfare. Aragorn and his companions might have been more skillful and tougher, however the mouth was a sorcerer and that makes a huge difference. He could possibly be able to beat an Ent. They were enormous, incredibly strong and impervious to projectiles. Only a hefty axe strike would have injured them, and it could have taken several blows to bring an Ent down. They could, however, be wiped out by fire and sorcery blasts. Finally, as terrible as the mouth of Sauron was, being eviler than any orc, even the evilest Haradrim and Easterlings were not as bad as orcs, the more terrifying was the hulking beast he rode that presumably wasn't a horse, and the flying steeds of the Ringwraiths might not have been birds, but a villainous beast of Mordor, or possibly even a nightmare horse. Since the mouth of Sauron was only present in one scene of the extended version of the movies, not much is known about him and his tremendous powers. He is also a character in a video game, and he has a host of powers and abilities within it. The mouth of Sauron has the ability to mount and dismount his black horse. The mouth of Sauron additionally spews evil magic in a limited target area, dealing massive single-target damage while also spreading to any adjacent units in the targeted region at the expense of power. The Mouth of Sauron may also cast a black mist over the target-friendly structure, confounding opposing forces. Enemies in the vicinity of the structure then go insane and proceed to fight each other. The Mouth of Sauron may also direct a tremendous beam of evil magic at the designated adversary dealing massive amounts of damage. With his misleading statements, the Mouth of Sauron confuses his foes, temporarily reduces the range and visibility of siege and troops by 50% but doesn't harm monsters. Poisonous words of Sauron's mouth sink his opponent's heart and sap their power. Enemies in the target area actually lose half their speed briefly. Cavalry slows down by 50% more while stomping. The mouth of Sauron persuades opposing heroes that their struggle is futile, causing them enormous anguish and severely undermining their morale. For a limited period, targeted enemy heroes deliver half damage. The mouth of Sauron sows division among his foes. For a brief period of time, hostile units in the targeted area engage in combat. To give the mouth of Sauron or even a ring of power a distinct identity is to degrade him. One who aspires to work with, serve, revere, and admire Sauron while increasing their strength and sorcery. He fell into darkness without being pushed to do so. He is arguably significantly eviler compared to any of the wicked ringwraiths, with the possible exception of the Witch King of Angmar. This is one of the reasons why many fan theories and speculations about him and his identity fail. They pale in contrast to what we may learn about the mouth of Sauron from the book alone, without the need to inflate his significance in the legendarium. Without the need to connect everything in Middle-earth, losing all mystery and fascination, can the mouth of Sauron not just be a wicked servant of Sauron, apart from rings and kings, and malevolent at heart? And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone.